Good afternoon again. Uh, we are going to start the next uh, session on current uh, re recent trends in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus. I request Dr. Kaushik Murli to start the first presentation. He'll be, st uh, he'll be talking on current strategies to prevent progression of myopia. Uh, Dr. Kaushik Murli is the president of Shangara Eye Institutions India. He is a pediatric ophthalmologist, Shangara Hospital, Bangalore. He has multiple publications. He has special interest in myopia management, amblyopia, and community-based interventions. He has been uh, working in collaboration with Harvard School of Public Health, London School of Hygiene on various research activities. And uh, I'm happy to say that he is also part of the team of AOS who developed the myopia screening guidelines. Over to Dr. Kaushik. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, it's a pleasure again to be here. Grateful to KSOS for the invitation to be a part of this session. Uh, myopia, is it important? This little graph shows you the number of publications that are there when you just in Scopus feed and myopia control. And you can see that in 21, it's almost double the number of studies that were there from a few years ago. Uh, when you look at this current strategies, the first strategy is in terms of how do you undercorrect. We are very clear that undercorrection results in educational delay and can result in the child being ostracized. So there is no real need to undercorrect or there's no logic that you should undercorrect. But again, as clinicians, we need to be clear whether we are overcorrecting. This starts off from the size of our refraction lanes. We did a small study to look at the length of the refraction lanes across some of our hospitals, and we realized that the minute your refraction lane cuts down to eight feet, and today most clinics are of that size, you need to actually reduce about 0.4 diopters or even half a diopter from the correction that you're giving them. The second question came in terms of the height of the vision chart. Sometimes it's at an eye level, sometimes it's higher. What we looked and saw was that the accommodation induced was minimal. So it's rather the length of the lane, irrespective of whether we are cycloplegic the child or not, that you need to be a little wary of when you're correcting them. Uh, there have been certain studies in terms of use of bifocals. Unfortunately, the audio is not playing here. But uh, if you look at this, uh, uh, this is a kid where we're given a bifocal, and you notice the way the girl on top is reading. Uh, because she's not able to, she's actually pulling up the chart to read from the top and not use the defocus distance. Two men carry the box inside. Three of my friends had never been to a circus before today. So if you notice her, what she promptly does, she lifts it up so that she's reading it from the distance segment. So often giving a bifocal may not be of any use at all to the child. Uh, the next strategy is to look at history. Sometimes we do linger a little bit longer in it. But again, strategy is to be clear about how we are defining progression. So in terms of the length, it is age bound. In children less than 10 years, about 0.3 millimeters per year is significant. In older children, 0.2 millimeters should also be considered significant. Higher the power at presentation, the more likely the child is to progress. So that becomes, again, something very important for us to keep track of. We also looked at saying that from a strategy standpoint, does the ambient light play a role? When we looked at different colored lights, it did not seem to play too much of a role in terms of progression, although the accommodative facility did improve with some of the lights. Uh, medications, there have been multi-analysis that looked at various interventions, and they've shown that pharmacological interventions are the best. Among this, again, a variety of drugs have been tried. What has stood the test of time is atropine. Again, not something new. It has been around from 1900. Literally was used, uh, proposed at that time to paralyze accommodation and prevent progression. This is a non-specific muscarinic antagonist. We are still not very clear about how this works. It seems to have a multimodal action, but somewhere it seems to be working through the D2 dopamine receptors. The ATOM 1 and 2 studies were the ones that showcased that atropine was tolerated and effective, and that 0.01% had minimum side effects and the least rebound. Uh, we also, before it was commercially available, did a little study where we reconstituted low-dose atropine and studied it over a period of time, and we showed it to be safe and efficacious. Why this becomes relevant is there will be a set of children where 0.01% atropine may not work. There you have an option of either using it two times a day, increasing the dose to 0.02%, 
or increasing to 0.05%. 0.05% has been tried as a part of the LAMP study, where they've shown that that has as effective as 0.01%. And again, in younger children, it has been proposed as the first modality of treatment. Personally, we don't prefer it in our institute to try it because we've not seen too many children where we've used it twice a day or 0.02 and beyond actually progress. Uh, we're worried about glare and the quality of life that these children may have with high dose. There is a current multicentric study ongoing in India and hopefully that result should tell us. It is always good to advise the children to spend as much time outdoors in daylight. Studies across the world have demonstrated its effect and this has been made part of the curriculum changes even in countries like Singapore where it's been mandated that children should spend at least two hours a day outdoors in sunlight. Again, we had looked at our own population of children who were on low dose atropin and what we found was children who spent 90 minutes or more, the progression was much lesser. This difference was even more significant in those who had a family history. Vitamin D again seems to play a role. Getting every child to test their vitamin D3 levels and normalizing it seems to again give some kind of a protective effect. And this again, we found it as a trend going forward. Peripheral hyperopic defocus is again supposed to prevent progression and discourage eye growth. Uh, there are two ways of doing it. One is using orthokeratology or contact lenses. The second is using defocus lenses. What you see on top, the names are the list of lenses that currently are available in India for uh, providing correction. Not all of them necessarily work. The reverse geometric designs are thought to work better. Again, we've not been able to convince too many children to use it because the use of it is they have to wear it overnight. And although world over the studies have been shown it to be effective, even they've only proposed it in terms of a combination therapy with probably low dose atropin. Uh, again, this is something that you need to wear overnight. Handling care maintenance is a challenge. You need to be able to do a topography. The fit takes time. Most of these lenses are imported in. So the DIMS lenses have, or the peripheral defocus lenses are now coming into work. This is similar to your car windshield in a rainy night, where through droplets you don't see parts of it, but the clarity in between still allows you to see what is on the road. So the analogy is very similar to that. So they have built in hyperopic defocus segments. This little video, if you notice it, you will see little specks of light in the center. Uh, and uh, that kind of showcases the defocus elements there. Uh, it is still very clear to see. Uh, we also looked at uh, So this is the defocus. This is looking through at a topography chart in clinic. The clarity is very good. And again, when you look at children, this is a child that we had dispensed and we'd asked her to send a little video because we were worried saying that, how will the child be able to run around and do things if the periphery is defocused? This, you can see the child happily running around. This is day one of the child actually using these glasses. That has given us a lot of confidence that this works. Finally, you need to spend a lot of chair time talking to both the children and the parents. Most children post-COVID find it difficult to manage screen time. Parents are extremely anxious about progression. Children are unable to find an alternate to screen use. So we need to identify certain ways of doing it and accept that screens are part of life. Again, we looked at saying that what matters is it the distance, is it the light. The minute you increase the brightness of the screen, and most parents think that a bright screen is actually harmful to the eye. Look at that child. The minute the screen is bright on the left, the uh, device automatically gets pulled away. And that may prevent the pull-in effect and the accommodation convergence should hopefully come down. Why are we making such a big deal about it? So what if there is a progression happening? Now imagine if we were able to reduce progression or a eight-year-old boy with a minus one diopter keeps increasing with time. By the age of 16, if you don't do anything, he may end up with minus five diopters with significant other comorbidities. Hence, it becomes very critical for us to focus on this aspect. Once again, a thank you for inviting me to be a part of this session. Thank you, Dr. Kaushik, for that very informative uh, talk. We'll have the discussions later. The next uh, speaker is Dr. Sumita Akarkar. She'll be speaking on update on management of congenital cataract. Dr. Sumita is the head of the Department of Pediatric Ophthalmology, Shankara Netralaya, Chennai. She has numerous publications uh, to her credit, and she is the Joint Secretary of SPOSI currently. Welcome, madam. Thank you for the organizing committee for inviting me. And uh, just a small correction there, I'm not the head of the department. Head of the department is still Dr. Surendran. 
but uh, so when we when we talk about the update uh, this is 1998 when imac was released viagra came france won the world cup there was a sandstorm and in between all these mega changing events i also completed my fellowship so but lot of from then to now the types of cataract which we have been seeing then and now are more or less similar we see a whole plethora of children with cataracts which are developmental traumatic uvi take blue dot steroid induced nowadays thanks to one of the uh, outfalls of covid has also been a, a, um, because of the digital uh, devices there has been a little bit of a change in allergic disease also and uh, steroid induced cataracts also i have seen there is a little bit of uptick in past 3 4 years so what has changed from then to now we, our anesthesia has changed machines all these things have modified to a great extent or to a smaller extent anesthesia is beyond my scope of talk here but yes we used to we have moved from halothane and nitrous based uh, induction to now very quick induction and quick uh, quickly deepening the plane and which is really helpful in pediatric cataract surgery which was compared because there is a little bit of positive thirst so i am very thankful for the anesthetist to adapting to the newer uh, things in anesthesia also so how the machines machines have gone from this humble universal two to console based um, more and more uh, sleeker designs and uh, voice overs to almost like where there is even microscope is not required you can operate on the screen so better machines have made a difference yes because automated aspiration and a good chamber uh, uh, fluidics have keeps the chamber form prevents meiosis during surgery prevent, preventing unnecessary malpolitions so advanced vitrectomy uh, settings which are available on the newer machines definitely allow us to have a higher cut rate and finer caliber has uh, of like 23 gauge has allowed us less traction on the vitreous and as a side corollary it has allowed some of the younger colleagues to implant iul first and then do a fairly safe uh, ppc and anterior vitrectomy with the newer machines which was not possible with the older vitrectomy machines which i was uh, which i and which i learned surgical techniques wound construction uh, these are the basically main steps of uh, surgical techniques which have not have not gone major changes in last 20 years but some of it we will cover it in this so i think we have moved from a scleral tunnels which we did to a clear corneal tunnel uh, which is uh, again allows us not to open the conjunctiva and lot of these children are prone for glaucomas and you can see if leaving a conjunctiva intact allows a glaucoma surgeon to relatively unopened conjunctiva and gives it a relief beneath. Uh, clear corneal incisions are also a little less um, disfiguring and less bleeding. So definitely, but if you look at the wound safety, probably corneal scleral tunnels are still, still much safer than, than clear corneal tunnel as far as the integrity of the wound is concerned, especially if, even, even, even when you're putting a suture. Rexes, again, uh, from touch and go of 1990s to now, the holy trinity of o good OVD uh, instrumentation, which allows you to move through a small side entry and dyes like Trapan Blue has made a uh, job really easy for even people who don't do that many numbers of pediatric cataracts. It has really definitely improved our life here. So as, I, as you can see this patient, it, was, it would have been impossible to do a rexis, but thanks to the dye, at least there is a, some amount of view in this patient, which was probably I would have lost the rexis uh, without this uh, dye. The newer technology in, is a precision pulse capsulotomy or uh, uh, femtolaser capsulotomy. Uh, Zeptolaser has been tried in children and has been published. Some data has been published in Indian Journal of Ophthalmology. It is uh, safe, small console relatively but probably is cannot be used in a uh, very, very young child with a very small anterior chamber depth. And femtolaser, of course, uh, you cannot use in combination with uh, general anesthesia, but older children who may allow you to make the 
flap uh, capsulotomy and under local or topical anesthesia, you probably can try it, and it definitely gives you a uh, really nice round uh, controlled rexis. Uh, posterior capsular management, because VA rates are almost 100%, uh, primary posterior capsulotomy is still gold standard, but as I mentioned earlier, with newer machines, probably you can do it uh, even after putting the intraocular lens. Younger children definitely need anterior vitrectomy, and but older children, you can uh, you can you you can get away without doing anterior vitrectomy by either using a posterior post uh, optic capture method or using a special lens like a bag in the lens. Both these techniques compare well with primary posterior capsulotomy in preventing VAO. So if you are confident about primary posterior capsulotomy and anterior vitrectomy, uh, it is definitely uh, absolutely foolproof. So let me not go through. So this is the bag in the lens. As I said, ki the, both the haptics, one flange of the lens is behind the uh, iris and one in the bag so that uh, there is no migration of the cells happen. So you can do a only thing it needs a precisely sized equal anterior and posterior uh, capsulotomy. And we have to capture both the flaps of anterior as well as posterior capsulotomy in the groove which is provided in the lens and one of the flange goes. So there is absolutely no chance that uh, lens uh, cells will uh, compare, uh, will migrate in the visual axis and cause VAO. But it is still non-foldable lens, requires a bigger incision and not available in India as far as possible, as far as I know. Uh, posterior capsulotomy capture, optic capture, again here you put an intraocular lens in the bag and without doing a vitrectomy, gently you can push the uh, optic of the bag, uh, uh, sorry, optic of the IUL through the uh, capsulotomy into the, um, uh, into in, in front of the anterior hyaloid face. Again, this will probably, will not need any kind of. IULs have gone a major uh, change. So these are all the IULs which are available uh, to us now. All of them are still available. Uh, foldable lenses were really the game changers in the real sense of the word. They did, they provided a paradigm shift in the, in the pediatric cataract surgery. Uh, because they allowed the lenses to be implanted through a really small incision, allowed a closed chamber through the surgery, you needed to open the chamber only to actually implant the IUL. And they are biocompatible and have definitely reduced, drastically reduced the incidence of postoperative inflammation. So these are the various design of foldable lenses which are available and they, now we have a plethora of designs and companies which are coming up with IULs which are fairly easy to use and uh, Insert, But IULs have also led to more questions. What is the age of implantation, target refraction, IUL power calculation? So can I have two minutes more? So age one year or older, probably IUL implantation is the standard of care. However, in 2023, it is more of an anatomical decision and not so much as the age of the child. So please consider IUL implantation in any eye if the corneal diameter is at least 10.5 millimeter and axial length is 18 millimeter, and has, child has absolutely no other ocular comorbidities like microcornea, microphthalmos, abnormal angles and everything. But if you are in, and also I will add another corollary to it, that parents should be willing to come for follow-up, especially if the children are younger. So if you think the follow-up is not going to be there, it's probably better, safer to leave the children of AK. Ever in doubt, good of AK is always comparable to pseudo AK and it doesn't. Some situations like JRA, actually the cycle has gone full from no IUL to back to no IUL as a standard of care over time because of the complications seen with intraocular lenses. So while we have sorted out age, uh, when it comes to power calculation, it is still complicated. There is no, presently no con consensus on best IUL formula. This is IGO 2021 as an editorial. This, this statement was made and I agree with it because there are Really, none of the formulas have been designed for children or capture the data, which is or, or nor do we have the data always, which is required for these formulas to work well. Uh, they are fraught with errors in younger children, especially if you are doing the measurements in general anesthesia. Small errors are definitely magnified. A 0.1 error of, magnif uh, of IUL axial length calculation in a child will be much more uh, lead to a much more error in the DBR than what you would get in an adult. So even a smaller error in a smaller eye is much more magnified. About the different formulas, there are conflicting data. 
one formula says this is good, another says no, this is the worst. If you look at the uh, literature, there are. But in best case scenarios, the success rate of hitting right is just about 50 to 60 percent. So uh, what do we do at this point? We combine two formulas and see the average of the two. SRKT can be used reliably compared, in, compared to newer generation. And uh, we have just published our data last year on Barrett's formula in children. And you can look, I have put a reference there. And we found that prediction error was same compared to, of course, we used uh, SRK2 as our uh, comparison formula. But you can, you can use a combination of two formulas to get to the correct power or a mean of two or average of two. I have really no recommendation at this point that this is always gets you the hit at the right thing. What else we are doing differently now in 2023? We are documenting baseline parameters much better. Surgery under anesthesia should be as an, taken as an opportunity to record baseline like gonioscopy and pachymetry, which we don't do normally, but we should. And examinations, this examination certainly points which patient need more close follow-up. So if you see a slightly anteriorly placed iris, you know you are, this child needs far more uh, stringent uh, glaucoma measurement. If you have a borderline cornea, you know you have, this child needs a more closer follow-up. Imaging modalities like ASOCT certainly improve surgical planning, especially in complex cases like PPC, where you know that there is a postcapsular ASOCT can give you a much, uh, you, you're much better prepared surgically if you see a postcapsular dehiscence. Uh, however, that does not take away the importance of a good clinical exam. What are we not doing enough? We still don't investigate the causes of cataract as much as we should. Bilateral cataracts need a genetic and metabolic workup, which we I think all of us, we don't do enough. Uh, sometimes gen identifying the genetic mutation can be life-saving in some cases, can prevent morbidities, uh, systemic morbidities, if you can put, and a lot of these children may, you may be the first clean point of contact with the medical world because they are coming for cataract and you can actually point towards their genetic mutation. Uh, costs are coming down for genetic testing and I think in future it should not be a limiting factor for us to do more genetic testing to know what exactly is genetic mutation pattern in our population. And of course, the uh, search for a perfect IOL formula goes on. What lies ahead? Better biometry, better calculations, and you need to be prepared for long-term complications. You need to be prepared for refractive interventions because these children are going to become more myopic. Some of them will require IOL exchanges. Some may require refractive surgeries. And we really don't know at this time what is the effect of time on IUL in a child's eye, where you have put the IUL at age of two or three, and how this is going to look 30 years hence. Maybe something like this. This is my one of my old 20-year follow-up. And you can see the lens, all the visual axis is clear. Child is still read 6-9. But this lens, you know how it is going. And he is still in his early 20s. So. I, I definitely see there will be a, <laughs> there will be a time when we have to remove this IVL and put another. So this is with this I end my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam, for that um, highly you know, informative talk. The next speaker is Dr. Elizabeth Joseph. Madam is the head of the department of Little Flower Ho ophthalmology department of Little Flower Hospital with decades of experience in pediatric ophthalmology. And she'll be speaking on innovations in surgical management of cranial nerve palsies. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll be talking on recent innovations in the surgical management of cranial nerve palsies. So before managing a cranial nerve palsy, we should follow certain basic principles. That is, all these cranial nerve palsies are potential for serious intracranial problems. So appropriate investigations uh, like imaging and neurology evaluation is needed uh, to manage conditions like vascular, ischemic, neurological, tumor, traumatic, etc. And then before doing any surgery, we have to wait for natural recovery for about three to six months. Surgery is always very challenging and has to be tailored to the features and requirements of individual patients. Now, uh, first, uh, I'll discuss about sixth nerve palsy because the, that is the co most commonest uh, nerve palsy which, are, which is coming to us. 
Initially, and in the acute stage, we have to give patching, especially in small children, we have to give an alternate patching. In small deviations, glass prisms and large deviations, uh, Fresnel prisms will help. Chemo denovation with the injection botulinum toxin is a very good option in the early stages. Uh, that will correct the primary position ESO deviation and the primary position double vision. So uh, botulinum toxin to the medial rectus in a lateral rectus palsy is very effective in the acute stage. It can be done under uh, topical anesthesia after putting drops. You just hold on to the medial rectus muscle with the forceps. Make sure that the entire medial rectus is in your forceps by trying to rotate the globe. And then with the uh, uh, tuberculin syringe loaded with the botulinum toxin of 5 to 10 units can be injected directly into the muscle, keeping the needle parallel to the sclera not to, uh, to prevent any perforation. And you have to be very careful that you should not inject it subconjunctively. It has to go into the muscle. If you uh, inject it subconjunctively, it may permeate superiorly or inferiorly and uh, may produce a levator palsy, ptosis, etc. So you can uh, press on the site with these Johnson's buds so that it, the, the drug does not disseminate. And you can see the two pictures. See, this is the pre-operative, uh, pre-injection picture with esotropia just one week after injection, the eyes have become straight and the patient has got a diplopia-free primary position. That is very remarkable. And coming to the surgical management, it, it, is, it depends on whether your palsy is a par, uh, partial palsy, that is paresis, or a total palsy. Partial palsy is uh, uh, recognized because the uh, force generation test will be positive. Some amount of movement will be there for the uh, uh, eye uh, to abduct. In that case, you can do a supramaximal medial rectus resection and LR resection. In total palsy, where the force generation is negative, we have to do various transposition procedures. Full vertical rectus transposition is there for many ages, but that has got the risk of anterior segment ischemia and uh, secondary vertical deviations. Then partial VRT, VRT Jensen's, Hummelsheim are all there for a long time. It, it is all partly effective. But the current uh, trend is uh, either to do a single muscle transposition of either superior rectus or inferior rectus to the lateral rectus or different types of Nishida's procedure. Uh, this is a condition, this is a uh, LR palsy where first the medial rectus, you can see the medial rectus muscle resist. After medial rectus recession, I am trying to do a superior rectus transposition. You can see the superior rectus muscle being disinserted after the pre placed sutures are in place. After the, then the superior rectus has to be freed as far back as possible from any facial attachment so that it can be mobilized laterally. And then you hook the lateral rectus muscle and bring the superior rectus towards the lateral rectus. By honoring the spiral of Trilox, you suture the superior rectus at the upper part of the uh, lateral rectus insertion at the sclera. And then it is better to put an augmentation suture behind. Uh, this surgery will convert some of the forces of the superior rectus from the elevating force to the abducting force. We can, now you can see the, uh, uh, this is the augmentation suture uh, placed about 8 millimeters behind the original, uh, original uh, insertion and um, that will help more of abduction force. And uh, Nishida's procedure is a recent thing. This was first published in 2004 and later updated 2005. Initially, Nishida uh, described muscle splitting, but nowadays, uh, without muscle splitting, you can do this procedure where uh, lateral half of the superior rectus, you can see the lateral half of the superior rectus and lateral half of the inferior rectus, a non-absorbable suture is passed and is, push, uh, is pulled laterally to the supratemporal and infratemporal sclera. That is the Nishida's technique. Um, I can show you the video also. Um, you can see the video. See, uh, the lateral rectus, uh, the superior rectus muscle is exposed and it is uh, cleared of all uh, facial connections. Uh, and then uh, a, a five zero non absorbable suture is placed involving the lateral one third of the muscle. And then this suture is pulled laterally so that the superior rectus is pulled towards the lateral rectus and a point 
midway between the lateral rectus and superior rectus, about 8 millimeters behind, is chosen on the sclera, and the superior rectus is sutured. Here, it, this does not involve any muscle splitting, no muscle disinsertion. So because of that, there is no risk of anterior segment ischemia. Now the same procedure is done on the inferior rectus muscle. Now you can see the inferior rectus uh, cleaned and the uh, 5 0 suture is passed on the inferior rectus and then it is passed to the infratemporal sclera between the lateral rectus and inferior rectus. And the muscle is pulled laterally so that there will be some amount of abduction torn for the uh, inferior rectus also. Now let us see the uh, preoperative. Preoperatively, the patient has got this much of esotropia and absence of uh, this one, absence of abduction, minus four abduction. Postoperatively, with the Nishidas procedure on the lateral rectus, uh, superior rectus, inferior rectus, and medial rectus recession, we could achieve postoperative orthotropia and increase in abduction from minus four to say minus one. Now this is a new, very new technique, vertical muscle transposition with silicon band belting. I'll finish very fast. And here we, uh, uh, we pass a silicon band through the uh, split superior rectus and lateral rectus and bring the silicon band towards the lateral side, passed underneath the lateral rectus and uh, uh, it is made tight so that the eye is made orthotropic. Now you can see the uh, superior rectus muscle being split. You can see the superior rectus muscle being split and then a silicon band will be passed underneath. The, see the silicon band? And then this silicon band will go underneath the lateral rectus and then underneath the inf uh, inferior rectus and pass through the lateral one third of the inferior rectus. That is the surgery. And then you pull on this uh, silicon band. Now the uh, silicon band is underneath the lateral rectus. Now you can see the inferior rectus muscle being split. And after the silicon band is passed, it is tightened to produce, to make this uh, globe orthotropic. The advantage of this is that the, the band will support the tension on the transposed muscle, unlike direct muscle suturing. You can see the pre-op pre uh, convergence squint with a minus five abduction corrected postoperatively. So these are two recent innovations in the management of um, uh, LR palsy. And now coming to fourth nerve palsy, I know I'm running short of time. There are, uh, these are all time tested uh, modalities of treatment for superior oblique palsy. Uh, in uh, ipsilateral inferior oblique recession, ipsilateral inferior oblique recession with superior oblique tuck if the deviation is more than 15 prism diopters. If the downward deviation is worse, you, you recess the contralateral inferior rectus. And ipsilateral superior rectus recession is done in case the primary position there is a superior rectus overaction due to contracture. And the Harada Ito procedure is done for to correct excyclotorsion. See, this is a child with superior oblique palsy with the uh, head tilt, primary position hyperdeviation, and um, uh, on adduction, the eye is slightly elevated, depression is defective, and uh, uh, we did a superior oblique tuck with inferior oblique recession. See, so, uh, after doing the superior oblique tuck, the primary position deviation is corrected and the head tilt also is corrected. So superior oblique tuck is done only if the superior oblique muscle is lax. Otherwise, we do just inferior oblique recession if the deviation is less than 15 prism. If it is more, you have to combine with some other muscle. And say so in long-standing superior oblique palsy, the superior rectus will go into contracture and the eye will become hyper, hypertropic. That can be treated by superior rectus recession of the same eye with the inferior rectus of the other eye, resulting in a good uh, surgical result. Coming to third nerve palsy, there is a lot to say about third nerve palsy, but I am going to, uh, I have another talk on third nerve palsy tomorrow in the same hall. So I am not uh, going into details of third nerve palsy for the uh, sake of avoiding repetition and to save time. 
Um, to be in short, in, the, in third nerve palsy, the eye has got a ptosis. Eye is fixed in the down and out position with exotropia, and the management depends on whether it is a total palsy or a partial palsy, whether there is aberrant regeneration, whether there is enough recovery or not. And with this, I am stopping my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam. Now I request uh, Dr. Kavita to go ahead with her presentation. Dr. Kavita is our guest speaker. She is from Shankara Hospital, uh, Shimoga. She is a very renowned pediatric ophthalmologist, has got many publications. Uh, he is the best paper winner of the COSCON for consecutive many years. Uh, over to you, Dr. Kavita. Thank you, ma'am, for that introduction. At the outside, I would like to thank uh, KSOC, Dr. Elizabeth Ma'am, and Dr. Srini for this uh, opportunity. I have no financial interest in this presentation. Now, we'll look at uh, briefly when and how to interfere in infantile exotropia. When Ma'am gave me this, mostly we talk on intermittent exotropia, but uh, infantile exotropia, yes, it runs parallel. But only thing is, this is a rare situation, and the onset is before six months of age and persists beyond this age. What has to be ruled out is pseudostrabismus. Yes, a simple pinch test, uh, test can differentiate as uh, shown in this uh, picture. And positive angle kappa, there will be no refixation movement when you're doing the cover and uh, uncover test and alternate cover set, uh, uh, test. Yet another feature is the early onset intermittent exotropia can be confused with uh, infantile exotropia. Coming to non-surgical management, first as is like Bhagavad Gita, first is to detect refractive error and then treat it and to detect uh, amblyopia and its uh, therapy that is uh, the conventional or the mainstay of treatment is being occlusion therapy. We also execute alternate eye occlusion therapy which acts as an anti-suppression technique. This uh, can improve the smooth pursuit, stabilize or decrease the deviation slightly like in infantile isotropia. Now coming to surgical intervention, it is required almost universally in true infantile exotropia. So if the deviation is less than 45 to 50 prisms, a single uh, eye surgery is uh, quite sufficient where we tackle the lateral rectus, we do a recession procedure. And on the medial rectus, we do resection and the more uh, common technique now is the plication. In case the deviation is more than 45 prisms, we need to think of uh, surgery on both the eyes, wherein you can think of bilateral la lateral rectus recession, or you do recession with uh, resection of one or two muscles, that is on the medial rectus. Botulinum toxin is also uh, used, and it can be the primary intervention, or it could be augmented during the primary surgery. But nevertheless, we need to think of recurrence and uh, the success rate is le lesser. I have no personal experience with Botox. Before really tackling on uh, these patients, we need to establish the diagnosis and uh, ensure that a repeatable and reproducible angles of deviation is obtained. Amblyopia detection and treatment is very essential. No matter what, reoperations are common, like under correction or over for over correction or uh, presence of DVD or oblique muscle dysfunctions. Now there are two schools of thought. One is the early surgery, which is uh, less than two years. We, the advantage being that we can obtain better fusion and binocular single vision. Nevertheless, there can be a small degree of over correction leading to monofixation syndrome and amblyopia. This is a, a, a condition that we need to really take care of. Coming to late surgery that is performing at the around four years of age, the advantage being that we can get a repeatable measurement at this age, and so the surgeon feels confident to operate. But there is a poor sensory outcome and increased recurrence rate. Now the goal of surgery is to align the deviated eyes within eight prism diopters of orthotropia, but like any other surgery, there are some side effects that it, there can be overcorrection or undercorrection. We can think of renal prisms, and it can be tried in both the situations. Now, coming to few surgeries that uh, we routinely perform is the weakening procedure is the recession, and here I'm showing the hangback technique. 
for larger angle of uh, deviation and you want a more uh, uh, bigger size or larger uh, measurement of recession, you can think of hang back. So I'm hooking the muzzle here. I'm dissecting the intermuscular septum. It's like taking a central bite at the center of the width of the muzzle, lateral rectus. And on the edges of the lateral rectus, first is the partial thickness and then the full thickness. Then you disinsert from the insertion site. Here one needs to take a superficial uh, bite on the surface of the sclera. Whatever desired measurement you want to do, I'm not uh, suturing here on the sclera, it is at the insertion site, so it is, the muzzle is just let back. Sometimes I do feel insecure that I've not taken a bite on the sclera, so I just uh, use another bite at that. But large recessions, it's sometimes difficult to take a bite there, so this hangback comes in handy. Now this is the conventional uh, recession method where you, you directly take for uh, on the bite on the sclera. What is essential is that as a beginner, we can always uh, make a note of these measurements that you're doing on the table and uh, the pre-op angle of deviation and keep a record of it and what, was the, what is the result that you get after these uh, measurements. So you can tailor make your, your own uh, techniques and measurements. I always prefer that the assistant holds the knot so that we can, it doesn't get loosened up. Now coming to resection, which is the strengthening procedure, which is performed on the medial rectus for uh, exotropia. Roughly about one uh, a millimeter corrects about uh, three prism diopters for recession and about uh, 2.5 diopters uh, for resection. So like the previous uh, situation, we take bites on the edges of the medial rectus. First is the partial thickness and then the full thickness bites. I also take a central uh, bite at the width of the muzzle, you know, so that there's no overhanging. And uh, it is equally important to release all the uh, attachments so that the muzzle can be approximated well. Use a muzzle clamp so that you don't lose the muzzle. An artery is applied where you want to really cut the muzzle for a few seconds so that there isn't uh, much bleeding. Sometimes I do leave a little bit of stump so it's easier to take a bite. Now the muzzle is, uh, needs to be brought near the insertion here. This is the central bite. You have to take it a little bit through the sclera. So you can feel it actually. There will be a tuck. Here the most important is after you release the clamp, ask your assistant to hold the knot for you so that it doesn't slip you are actually strengthening. So we shouldn't have a hang back of the muzzle. So it becomes a recession. So all the three sutures are uh, tied up. Yet another, uh, something like uh, old wine in new bottle. This is plication, which has been practiced earlier. Now we have come back to, instead of cutting the muzzle, we just fold the muzzle over it. So folding of the muzzle. This is again taking bites on the lateral edges of the medial rectus. Now what is uh, to be done is that you take a bite at the insertion and then at the middle part of the uh, muzzle, basically it will be something like a U and you come out at the middle part of the muzzle. 
Now pass a iris repositor beneath the four loops that you have obtained. Ask your assistant to withdraw the muzzle away from you and then pull these uh, uh, sutures with the needle so that the muzzle gets folded on, on itself. And then you tie it up. So you are really here, you are not really cutting the muzzle. The advantage is that in case you have undercorrection or overcorrection, you can always titrate this later. You haven't really cut the muzzle and thrown off. So, so that's it. So there is no hump or anything. It's quite flat and, uh, you know, most of the time as a beginner, we might feel there will be a hump on the surface of the conjunctiva the next post-operative day. So nothing like that. In large uh, uh, recessions or uh, that you want to do for large angle deviation, yet another technique is the true muzzle transplantation. I have not tried it in younger children, but as a part of intermittent exotropia or constant exotropia, this can be tried. Where the resected muzzle, about four to five mm of it, instead of throwing it, you bring it and attach it to the muzzle that you want to recess. That is the basic principle there. So it has an additional lengthening effect and uh, you get a better result. Most of the times what I have seen is that instead of operating on the, the second eye, this uh, true muzzle transplantation has helped me in uh, uh, eliminating second surgery. So that is the muzzle which is uh, resected. And uh, now the desired, whatever we had desired earlier to do recession, that much millimeter is, uh, uh, you know, you put the sutures there. To join the two muscles, I'm using a, uh, you can see it is a blue color suture, it is a non-absorbable suture, a mattress suture is placed. For beginners, it will be a little difficult, but then it can be done. So post-operative results uh, depend on refractive error that is present in the way we have treated, compliance with spectacle wear, the pre-op and post-op angles that we obtain and additional uh, oblique muscle dysfunction, whether it is there or not, and DVD. Uh, one thing, most important contributing factor for the results is the duration of misalignment. It's really a significant factor. Thank you for this opportunity. Now I request Dr. Meena, thank you, Dr. Kavita. I request Dr. Meena to go ahead with her presentation on Cerebral visual impairment. Dr. Meena Sike is a senior consultant at uh, Little Flower Hospital, Langamali. She's a, uh, she's a pediatric ophthalmologist and a very uh, famous cataract surgeon, phaco surgeon. And um, he has many publications, has done many instruction courses. Over to you, Dr. Meena. Thank you, madam. Good afternoon, all. Uh, I'll be speaking on cortical or cerebral visual impairment and how to deal with it. So first, what is, uh, what is cortical or uh, cerebral visual impairment? It is a visual loss with a damage to the retrogeniculate pathway and usually with an absence of any ocular pathology. So the insult could be at the level of the cortex or most commonly what we see when we, when, when we send these children for neuroimaging, the, we get a periventricular leukomalacia, which is the most common finding that we see in a neuroimaging. So the significance of this condition is that usually you get a normal ocular examination, not always, and the associated neurological findings are very significant. And here the parents as well as the examining physician will be unable to comment on the visual status of these children. So a few uh, theory on this uh, visual acuity and their per uh, perception, like we know that the occipital cortex is the main uh, main structure for our visual, ac visual uh, acuity, but you have a dorsal stream and a ventral stream, and this dorsal stream which goes into the parietal, posterior parietal lobe, that is mainly concerned with the mapping of visual uh, images, whereby we can walk around normally in an environment, and the ventral stream which goes into the temporal lobe is mainly for the memory. So we need a coordination of these or all these centers for a proper visual perception. It's just not the visual acuity. You need a perception of the vision also to walk around in the environment. So all this has to work in coordination, which does not, does not occur in these children. And there are a number of causes uh, which, uh, for CVI. And infants, the most common one being hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. And you can get CVI even in adults following a CVA. 
Now coming to the systemic features, uh, numerous systemic features, mostly neurological are seen in them, along with other sensory problems like hearing problems are seen in them. So the common uh, CVI, the common ocular symptoms in CVI are uh, situations like this, like they can have something like a light gazing, they will just stare into the light, or they can have photophobia, which is more common, and uh, blunted or avoidant social gaze, brief fixations, and intermittent followings, all these are the features, and most of them will have neurological problem. So it will be very difficult for us to assess the vision. And poor visual acuity, as, as I mentioned, will be there, and it will be difficult to assess. And visual field loss, even though we find it difficult to assess, what we have seen is that the inferior altitudinal defects are very common. Usually they have a particular head posture. Probably it is due to their field loss. And first thing, usually they come to us with a neurological workup, but in case they don't come with it, you have to send them for a proper neurological workup and imaging and confirm your diagnosis. And in case uh, detected, you have to work out a management strategy, which may not be the same in all. And uh, you have to rewind and list out all the signs and symptoms and then decide on the treatment. And the first thing, before going to the patient, the criteria for the caregivers, they have to be Patience and empathy is extremely important, and it's not just the ophthalmologist who have to manage this. You need occupational therapist, and, and it, it will be a coordination of many treatment strategies, and you have to treat or train according to symptoms and signs, and set limits. And assessment of visual acuity in these children has been, they can be assessed by Hoy et al., six different levels, of which level one is perception of light, that is the lowest level, and level 6 is an almost normal sensory visual examination. So there are few terms that you have to be familiar with, and you have to unlearn a few things in treating or managing these children with CVI, like mostly it is these agnosias. So what is object agnosia? There is a visual perception issue where they have difficulty in recognizing objects presented visually. Like if you show them a bicycle, they'll be able to see the uh, handle the wheels, etc., but they may not be able to perceive it as a bicycle. And optic ataxia, it is a visually guided movements are less accurate. Just like grasping a mug, they may, they may not be able to grasp it properly. And this uh, last one is very important, which is a simultagnosia that is not to know a lot of things at a time. They can perceive only a fewer things. So here comes the uh, unlearning part for us, especially for me, because whenever a child like this come to us, I had a, at least I had a habit of telling them, show them lots of colors and lots of things, but it's not so, because their speed of processing is very low. So there is, they can't take too much of, to see and too much to grasp uh, red signals for them. So this is the concept of putting them in a tent where they don't have too much to see and only a few things for them to concentrate on and isolate the visual status. So this is a no for these children, that they have lots of stimuli for them, that will be difficult for them. So try to treat them in, mini in a minimalist attitude, like in a minimalist environment where you have only a very few things, and avoid crowded areas. So this is the main reason they are very irritant when they come to a crowded OPDs. So obviously that is not the place to treat them. And they, just like in amblyopia, they are more receptive to single optotypes. So show them single letters which are broader than their, uh, than their line of visual acuity and treat them in familiar surroundings and background. And also they are more, uh, they will be more attracted to high contrast. Like you can see this high contrast panda. And whenever you have to teach them on, an, uh, on a particular thing, like show them, enlarge that feature, like enlarge the features of the toys, the eyes or the nose, etc., so that they can concentrate on that. And also they react better to moving objects than stationary ones, but you have to set the limits. Because very high speed, they, can, they may not be able to perceive. So you have to find a comfortable distance and speed of movement. And usually they have washed out colors. So you can uh, do the color naming, like give an adjective to all the color. Like you can say this is a black crow and a green leaf, so that they will relate it to that. And usually the lower visual field defects are very common that I've mentioned earlier. So in such cases, you, can, you should be clearing the floors for them and holding their hands and the reading stand where they can make use of their upper fields are more important. And stairs are the, yes, another danger area where you can get, give them colored 
uh, colors on the stairs were reflectors which, so that they, get, they know that they have to put up their legs onto the stairs and colored markers on the doors. And uh, because of the head posture, there are also vertically printed notes. According to the head posture, they can be given vertically printed notes uh, for reading and horizontal and vertical spacers and magnifiers, wrap around sunglasses for photophobia. So first of all, empathize with them and first stay within their limits and what our role will be use maximum utilization of their seeing capacity with the help of other therapists. Thank you. Uh, now it is for uh, time for panel discussion. I will request uh, Dr. Laila. Dr. Kavita, shall I <laughs> ask you the uh, muscle transplantation? Uh, is uh, you already said that it is done in adults only, isn't it? No, I have done in adults. Not at, uh, as an indication for infantile exotropia. This, uh, I just gave an option. Probably we can extend it to a younger age group, that's what, because uh, I've got good results. And, and in some situations, let's say, for example, 60 to 65 PD and all, where you actually you will be counseling the patient for second uh, surgery. If you, if you follow the conventional uh, recess resect, which we've been practicing for over years, uh, we would be landing up doing the second eye, the other eye. But uh, after I have shifted to true muscle transplantation with reluctance though, I have found that uh, in most of the situation, it, it's only single eye. So I'm thinking now instead of, you know, being narrow about our uh, options, we can try that. And only this thing is, is getting option. the sutures secured and we're using the non-absorbable. Uh, first I used to use the, uh, I mean, proline. But putting the knots is little difficult. And it, uh, you know, the, as a surgeon, we don't feel secure that whether the knots will remain there. Because proline, it slips off and you, know, you need to put at least six to eight uh, knots. And the fear is that whether it, uh, you know, it makes a bulge on the surface, uh, these older children. So I shifted to Ethibon, that's giving good results. Done in large angle exotropes. Yeah, it's, uh, you can try even in uh, isotropes, ma'am. I've done that, and it's giving up to 90 prisms. They can. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Only thing you have to titrate on the millimeter of muscle that you're transplanting. 4 mm is minimum. It's difficult, though, to cut and try, you know, suture and bring it here. Um, no, ma'am. Uh, like, only thing is, uh, when will you actually, what is the ideal time that you will intervene for intermittent exotropia patients, surgical intervention? When will you intervene for intermittent exotropia? No, I will, uh, there are many things that I would, I would assess. First is to get the repeatability of measurement. So, two and a half years I have done, but I am not very happy on that. I would prefer at least three and a half years. Uh, because repeatability of measurement, getting the same measurement, then you have to analyze the parents, what they are expecting out of you. That is the most important. And many patients, you know, they're not very keen on surgery at that young age. So you make them come to you at least three or four times before you really touch them. That is my, you know, uh, norm, a, actually. There is a three to four growing, measurements I take. It's a growing consensus of strabismologists who are saying that intermittent exotropias should not be operated now. It so depends, you know, it depends. You have to check on the stereopsis as well. If it's deteriorating, then we can think of... Uh, and the frequency, if it's increasing... Later is better. Later is better. And uh, yes, if we can. Because I... The recurrence rates are really high. Chances of coming back again. Uh, yeah, <laughs> non consecutive, but <laughs> residual. <laughs> it's intermittent, it's always residual. What I have uh, seen is, in, if, even if it is an intermittent exotropy, I think uh, we have to look at the retina also. Sometimes I have seen that a small amount of sometimes the cone dystrophies earlier on can present as an intermittent exo. So I think we should not miss out such cases also. That, that is what. Uh, in uh, intermittent, we have um, in our uh, thing institute, sometimes we tr have tried uh, overcorrection. So 
for uh, such cases. And we definitely have found a little bit benefit, at least for temporary period, if you give it. You can always tell uh, the child. And most of the parents come back telling that they have, have better control with that over minus correction. But we should always tell them that it is a temporary measure only. We'll have to uh, take the child off the glasses later on. And then maybe at four years. There is uh, one recent study which has come out about the over minusing. And uh, the little worrying part was that they were not able to wean the children off that myopic glasses and children actually became myopic. Not only the same change was seen in hypropic children who became less hypropic quite rapidly during the course of uh, the follow-up. So a little, uh, now, a little breaks about uh, <laughs> over minusing. So there is a small subset of patients who will do well with over minusing, but this recent evidence looks like it, you are also pushing them towards myopia. Actually, Bert and Krishna's paper is there long back that uh, long-term follow-up of over minus corrections did not produce the progression of myopia yes, also. That's right, but the, there is one recent study coming from New Zealand. I think AC by a ratio also plays a role in that. Now, our guest faculty, uh, uh, the organizing committee has given a momento. I request Dr. Laila uh, to hand over the momento to Dr. Kaushik, please. Can we all stand up? Can we all stand up? Momento. Now I request uh, Dr. Meena to hand over the momento to Dr. Kavita. Dr. Now I request Dr. Nina to hand over the momento to Dr. Sumita Agagar. Sorry, we request the PGs to participate in this uh, preliminary. Please come forward. So thank you very much, and thank you for a patient hearing. It was a great session. Thank you very much. PGs are requested to occupy the front rows. <laughs>